That's the thing I talk about when passion, you combine your passion with your talent to provide the most value. So she'd obviously found that sweet spot and you feel it. If you look at it as a deeper level of business is just people value money versus the thing they to buy or vice versa, right? So for example, if it's a watch, you might value my watch more than your money. So you give me and I value your money more than the watch. That's where the transfer occurs, right? But it also happens energetically. If I want what you're giving, I'm willing to pay for that service or whatever it is because I want to feel that feeling. Hey guys, welcome back to More Clients, Less Efforts in for another exciting show today. And I'm joined by a good mate of mine, Andrew McComb. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Mate, uh, you've uh, you've shot me this bio, which is it's is lengthy, but I'm going to go through it all because it's it tells a really interesting story of, of your journey and, and who you are. Mate, you're a man who thrives outside your comfort zone in 1997, fueled by grief from the death of his goals, brother, and a dream. You... Andrew embarked on a journey to Australia to qualify for the Sydney 2000 Olympics. This experience ignited a 12-year passion for empowering others to achieve ease in their health, wealth, and relationships and careers, leading him to establish three successful health clubs, write insightful books, and create impactful online programs, which we're going to drill in into later on in your, your, your process. Driven by an adventurous spirit and a deep love for golf, which I enjoy, but I must admit my handicap is actually my golf swing, not a number. Andrew pivoted to create the Golf Getaway, the world's only golf travel TV show. He followed the success with the Golf University, the Premier Golf Improvement Program, and further expanded his reach with a search for Scratch and documentary, and they got world's first golf TV subscription channel, the 19th Hole, alongside the Snow Show, and all of which continues to captivate audiences today, massively leveraging LinkedIn, that's on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube. Andrew has returned to his tribe, The Outliers, with the Outlier book and TV series, which we're going to drill into a little bit more. Coast series, coaching media and marketing consultants of entrepreneurs and athletes, and The Outlier book of the series for children. Now, you've written 100 books in the last, like, since we caught up. So, last couple of months, mate. So, we're going to get into that as well. And, mate, all wrapped around your mission and purpose for people around the world to break their uniqueness and live life on their own terms and dare to venture beyond the confines of the ordinary, which I love, mate. And, and a purpose very near and dear to my heart and, and my own purpose as well. But, uh, mate, thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me, mate. Yeah. Great little bio there. A lot of, lot of stuff gone into it, obviously, but yeah, happy to share it and, and we'll delve into that even more. Man, let's, let's go let's go to, to the Olympics 2000, back 24 years or so ago now. What was it? What, were, what was your sport? So beach volleyball. Yep. Okay, so came to Australia from New Zealand, 97, to train to go to the Olympics. Cut a long story short, never made it because I needed to fund my journey. And to fund my journey, I used my PE degree or physical education from Otago University in New Zealand and found very quickly that I had a real passion for entrepreneurship and put the volleyball on hold for a few few years. Obviously, I was ranked by grief too. So that sort of impacted the volleyball and the desire at the time and started my own personal training studio, evolved to have three health clubs. And then the more staff I had, the more clients I had the less time I had and less money I had for myself. So I said, well, how can I change this? And as as you do, when the question, you ask the question, the answer appears very soon after. What's the other term they use when the um, the, the student is ready, the teacher appears? And I got a internet marketing pamphlet in my PO box in 97, right? So think about that. That's very early to be. That's, that's before it's called digital marketing. Yeah. And I couldn't get my head around how to turn personal training, a physical thing, into an online program, product, etc. It took me a while, but once I got my head around it, I then wrote books. I created online programs. I did coaching that supported it. Sold my books all around the world. Did speaking. All of that kind of goes with it. And then then I taught others how to do the same. But that was actually probably the, one of the most frustrating things because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Yeah. And I was an ambassador for a number of corporates who had large databases of other corporates where I'd go and speak or they'd read the books and stuff. And so a lot of my clients were corporates, and the, but they wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to run their own business. The problem they had was they, even though they hated what they did, it was too cushy, right? They were getting paid really well. They didn't have to think after Friday night. They could go home for the weekend. 
and it was hard for them to jump off the cliff. And I'd be down at the bottom of the cliff saying, come on, guys, I've jumped many, many times. Jump, it's, you're going to be fine. But they just couldn't leave the comfort zone. So the frustration caused me to then turn back inward and look at myself and say, what do I... So I've got a whole formula around passions times talents equals value. So I look at that for myself and go, what am I passionate about right now? What am I talented at? My passions at the time, I just started playing golf and my talents are creator, mechanic and star. Mm-hmm. And profile and tool called wealth, 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 wealth Dynamics there, isn't it? What's yeah, 100% Profile Dynamics. Dynamic. Brilliant tool. And I applied the two and then looked at myself and went, I'm a creator. Uh, what am I passionate about? Golf. And then so I went through a whole system of questions I asked myself around, what do I want to do in the golf space? And I was too old to be a pro. So there's two forms of pro, right? There's the pros on tour who play, and then there's the golf pro in the shops who sell things and and do lessons and and book rounds and stuff. I didn't want to do either of those. So I was like, well, what do I want to do? And I loved video marketing at the time and, and video. I find it's the most leverageable tool. You film something once and you can share it millions of times over. Yeah. You can also strip the audio, you can transcribe it, make a book out of it or a blog or whatever. So it's a beautiful tool. There's a massive leverage in in the content creation when you create a video asset. Like I like podcasting for the same reason where, you know, we get on to have a conversation. To be fair, we probably would have had this conversation anyway, right? And we have, you and I have known each other for a while now. We have had these conversations already. All we're doing is recording the conversation that we're having about a topic that we're both really passionate about, you know, about business growth, about living your passion and your dreams and sort of inspiring others to also be able to do so. And we're recording it and we're sticking it on the internet. Yeah. It's to inspire others, right? To hopefully do the same for themselves in some way. Mm. Absolutely. Where do you, for you, where do you think that, where does that passion for helping and inspires, inspiring others come from? And obviously a lot of this, this is through your own, I think we have to live our own values, which you, I know you very much do, but where do you think that comes from good question so I, i'm going to be honest like until i was 19 i didn't really give a shit about anyone but myself like most people right but my brother died and when he died i was in grief like serious grief for six months but then i actually realized in his death and and so in the death process or grief process you start to look inward right and, and you question life i guess and in that process, I just read the house down on personal development books. And I was always passionate about that anyway, but more deeper spiritual work stuff. And then realized that I want to use his death, not just as as a, a shame or a, or a waste, but actually to do something about it. So I, it's really strange. As I was flying, so a quick story, I was when I found out he was dead, I was away playing a beach volleyball tournament in the north of New Zealand. My parents couldn't get hold of me for a week, right? So I turn up at this tournament. And the tournament director comes down to the beach and says, you got to call your dad. And you could tell by her tone, I just was shocked instantly. I went, oh shit, what's happened? Yeah, it's one of those kind of like premonition. You you don't want to have... Like something's not right here. Something's not good. You don't want it. So I rang my dad and he told me my brother had died. And um, was that something expected? Like was he... Well, he was mentally, physically handicapped, but it wasn't... He'd been told a few years earlier, like he had been sick, went to hospital and they actually said, go home and prepare for him to die. But... It was more of yeah, the confidence. Even, even with that, you know, even when uh, if you know it's coming, I mean, you're told it's not. It's not an easy thing to adjust to, is it? I just thought they were incompetent doctors. They're lazy. They just that was their answer because they didn't know an answer. Anyway, years went past, and then it happened, and I was just stunned. But I just well, but going back to the story, the the funeral had been organised literally two days later. So I had to race down from Auckland to Dunedin, where I come from, and go to the funeral. But the day after the funeral, I'd already been booked on a flight out of Hamilton to fly back to Sydney where I was going to start training and we're going to work and 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 actually go to the US to play volleyball and I was flying out of Dunedin on my way after the funeral and I looked down at the crematorium because you can see it as you fly out and I went I'm going to have one life for you my brother and one life for me and in hindsight that's a mad decision because for the next 15 years I was super busy right this madness almost and everything I did and I do things all or nothing anyway but I actually went to a retreat, what, maybe 10 years ago and, and actually had to almost felt like exercising my brother. He, he sort of came out in this rebirthing process and because it, it was like, it's time to have a life for me, not him and me, if that makes sense. And that's where the golf came around was, it was like, well, what do I want to do now for me? And it was travel the world playing amazing golf courses and share it with other passionate golfing tourists. So that was the start of that journey, but it was, it's not that I don't do everything for my brother, but it's like, and, and also I do everything to try to inspire others, but 
what I found in that is you can only control yourself, right? And whatever other people think of you or how they react to you or do from you, like from your advice is none of my business. So mm. other retreats, I've realized that too. It, it makes no difference. They'll do whatever they're going to do. So the best thing I can do is what I want to do. And if that makes a difference, so be it. But it's not to say I don't always create things that are going to try to make a difference. And I try to do it in the most leveraged possible way. When, when did you like realize that, that this could be like a business that would support you in the lifestyle you want to do and, and, and now your family? Great question. So, so before I, so I was living in Dunedin in 90, it must've been 96. I was finishing uni in 96. And, and as you do at the end of uni, you're like, what am I going to do? And all I wanted to do, it's like, in, in theory, you go to uni to work out what you'd like to do. You've yeah, you had a lot of money to work out. <laughs> well, what I'm just going to put this as a placeholder you know, to appease my parents and maybe I'll decide what I want to do afterwards. Yeah. I just said, I was talking to, we're doing some filming for golf at the moment. I was talking to the super this morning, one of the courses and, and he was from Dunedin. He went to the same uni and I went, what a joke. I went for, as a four year degree. And I only went for the first year and the rest I was in the gym playing volleyball, right? And training. So it's really, I say it to anyone, university is a business. It's not in your best interests necessarily. Your best university is to travel and enjoy life and learn for yourself. It's not to, you know, you could spend more money or the better use of your money traveling. So anyway, I, at the time I was coming to the end of that four years and I was like, what am I going to do? And I, I thought I'd love to be a personal trainer because I, I, I love, you know, helping and coaching and stuff. So I went to a Les Mills thing in Dunedin and I went, bingo, there it is. I can travel the world, do whatever I want and train people. And as I know now, that's not 100% true because you still need your clients and that. But that was initially the start of the journey. And then that evolved to when I went back to Sydney, we're looking to open a personal training studio. And then that evolved to health clubs. And then it evolved from there to more leverage stuff like writing and and coaching and selling online, etc. I think there's some big takeaways in there for me is that, you know, when you... You know, when you find something you're really passionate about it, it, and you can share that with people, it doesn't really feel like a business. It just kind of naturally happens, doesn't it, right? Yeah. I'd say I've never been in business. The only time I do feel like I am is we've when... made money from your passion, not necessarily, you know, by design going on yeah. to sell widgets. I, I, the thought of selling something for no reason would make me feel, and this sounds crass, but I'd feel like a prostitute, right? And I just cannot, at the values level do that so i have to be passionate to get the drive to be able to do it and then if it makes money or not at times i don't care (laughs) it's like at least i got to enjoy my life while i did it and i'll I'll never look back at the end of my life and say i never had a great life right so but what you find and and you'd find this tim and and most of the entrepreneurs out there somehow somewhere something happens regardless and you don't know who what where why or when but it does and now i call that synergy and, and the magic happens. And the magic to me only happens when I'm in my flow doing what I love. But it's quite profound. And it's something for the mind. The mind can't get its head around it, or my mind can't. But my heart absolutely knows it. Now, I've got a really, I've got a cool other story if you want me to share it. Yeah, please do. So when I was setting up my golf show, right, I was doing six months of a massive to-do list. And nothing was working. And I had a real bad headache and bad neck. And I'd stop going to the gym. I'd stop playing golf. And I was just trying to do everything I could, like, 18 hours a day, six at six days a week to try and get the show going. And so one day I'm walking along the beach and I ran into a mate of mine who he does voice dialogue and voice dialogues, essentially everyone has sub personalities and if they're not working together, they create conflict and therefore your external reality will reflect that. Mm. So he said, well, why don't you come and see me? So I went and saw him and the process is essentially like Tim and I are doing now, we're sitting facing each other. He sits opposite me and he says to me, so tell me what's going on. And I just said, Exactly what I just said. Nothing seems to be working. I'm banging my head against the brick wall, doing all the stuff, stop playing golf, stop going to the gym, stop enjoying everything, and I'm over it. And he goes, well, where in the room would you go if you were that energy right now? And so I literally dived on the floor and lay down like a snake on the floor. And at first, I didn't realize it was a snake. I just thought I was lying on the floor. And he started talking to that part of me. And and as he's talking to that part, you, you and until you experience this, you won't understand it, but you go into the energy of that entity, right? So I'm on this floor like this conniving snake in the grass going, oh, that bloody Andrew, he's always busting his ass, working his ring off. He stopped going to the gym. He stopped playing golf. And I'm going to trip him up until he goes, you know, until he has some fun. And and, and my mate, the practitioner goes, so you're the saboteur. And he goes, yeah, I'm the snake in the grass and I'm going to trip him up. And he was real cunning, right? I I just know the energy that came over him. He goes, if he's not having fun, I'm going to stop him, which just goes against everything, right? You think, well, if I work harder, I'm going to get the outcome I want. And it was telling me I need to have fun. So cut a long story short, 
I, as soon as I left his office, I was on his balcony, literally out the door. I was on the phone to the gym. I'd rejoin, done, right? That's number one. Second one, walking down the street because my house is just around the block. I'd rejoin the golf club. Got back playing golf in two weeks' time from then. Oh, ha actually, this is one other thing. So the practitioner says, okay, so you, you're you telling Andrew all of this about what you're going to do. What do you want him to do? And he said, I want him to join the golf club and I want him to join the gym again. And then my friend says, so what will you do? He goes, don't worry about it. I've got it sorted. Like in the most smug, just arrogant way. And so he, so what you do then is you go back to your original position. So I sat back in the chair and he goes, what did you just hear? I said, well, I need to have more fun. I need to join the golf club, join the gym. And he'll, he goes, well, what? And did you hear what he's going to do? And I went, yeah, he's going to sort it out. He goes, but I don't know what he's going to do. Like there was no telling me what he was going to do, but he's going to sort it. So I'll just trust that. So that's when I went, left and, and wrote, rung the course, etc. Two weeks later, the show got picked up by a TV network and it got picked up in a way that had nothing to do with my to-do list, mm. which is just profound, right? And and so from that moment on, when things aren't working for me, I go, where am I not? So I actually went home and wrote the agreement with myself. If I'm not having fun, the saboteur will turn up and show me that because things won't work, I'll feel like I'm banging my head against the brick wall. But in the meantime, he actually wants to have a holiday. He's sick of tripping me up. He wants a rest, right? So I know if I'm in the flow, he's having a rest. So we're we're in a good partnership there. Yeah. How, important it, anyway. think, how important is is doing that kind of work for business owners? Like I know you've spoken to to lots over your you know your business journey. Do you recognise people like that? And and how is it sort of recognise in yourself that you're not in flow? And because as you said, like when you're when you're in flow. And without getting too woo-woo and, and sort of throwing out sort of the energy terms and stuff, it kind of just attracts what you need to succeed when you're in, in that state. Yeah. How hard is it to, for someone to recognize when they're not in that flow state? Well, it's a good question because what I notice is I, so you, I have a philosophy that your external reality is a reflection of your internal. And if you're not happy with your external, don't try to change it externally. Try to change it internally through your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs that then lead to your behaviors that then create a different reality, right? So what I notice, so essentially it's a mirror for your inside, right? Your, outs, your outside's a mirror for your inside. And I notice it as if I start sharing my message and I get resistance from others, rather than seeing their resistance, I go, where am I resisting my own message, right? And it's usually at a time when I'm super busy or doing things that are contrary to my whole message of ease, which we mentioned in my bio earlier. Mm. Ease is it. When, if you look at it as an anagram, is E for energetic or physical, A for analytical or mental, S for spiritual, and E for emotional, right? So if those four things are in alignment, things happen easily. Well, you yeah. flow, right? But I know if, if I look around at my external and I'm seeing things that aren't working, I always look at myself. And I know that when emotions up and tell us, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive amount of vulnerability that we need to, to accept yeah, in doing so, isn't there? And it's ownership, right? It's, it's it's quite it's very easy to go. Well, it's your problem, you know. You you know you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. But I think I really like that message of actually turning it internally and going, okay, let's look at these sort of four areas. And even if I, I guess I imagine you just have a notebook or something, right? You know, just take a notebook and kind of write those letters down and go, well, where am I in each of these things, and what can I improve myself to then attract energetically success externally as well. Yeah, it's a great, another great point. So what I do is, so I've got a process, right? I will tune in to the feeling that I'm feeling. Okay. Talk to me, talk to me about how you do that. How do you tune into that feeling? Close your eyes and we can do it with you, me, anyone, right? I've, I've got a client in the next hour actually who's, who's what, doing my golf program at the moment and she's mm. started the program and it's a deep program around golf. It's not about the swing or anything. And all of a sudden she's got all these physical ailments have come up, all these sabotages have come up, right? And I having a session with her. So I'll give you an example on her. The, the, the physical body is the best barometer to access between your internal and your external. So the, what I always get a client to do is tune into the highest priority feeling that they're feeling right now physically. So that could be a sickness, an injury, or an ailment. Then I get them to put their attention on it, right? So in her case, she's got tendonitis of the hand. So I'll get her to focus on her hands, close her eyes, deep breath, mm. Tune into the actual vibration or feeling in the hands. And then what happens really quickly is your subconscious starts putting up memories or insights of past or, or projected future events. And then out of that, you go, well, how do you feel about that? And then the key, the feelings float up. 
And so I'll just making one up. Let's say betrayal comes up, right? Okay. So I get them to feel it. They feel as much as they can. And usually within 30 seconds, the opposite feelings underneath, they just want to feel totally embraced or whatever, or successful or whatever. And then I get them to feel that as much as they can. And obviously, the more they feel that, the more they start attracting that in their external environment once they leave the session. But if I look at the betrayal side of it, it's like I then, so if I use that process for me, I'd look at betrayal and go, where am I betraying myself in my life right now? And so I'll go through all the key. Is it in my relationship with my wife, my kids, myself, in relation to what I love, I'm not doing it. And and often it'll be in relation to my golf or, or something I really love. If I'm not doing it to how I want to be doing it, I say, there it is, I'm betraying myself. Okay, so how would I rather be doing it? And then I'll identify and, and design it how I really want to do it. And then I have to, like everyone, stay very true to that. Because if I go, and we talked about this off the call, Tim, if I start wanting to do things just for the money and then you start getting a few clients who they're not in alignment they actually make you feel devalued or whatever but you're doing it anyway just to get some cash it's not going to work anyway right mm. so you but what happens is you will get your subconscious will present you physical world realities to show you that anyway so they'll end up betraying you they won't pay you they'll treat you like a bag of shit while you're filming for them or whatever and, but you knew it before you started. So it wasn't ideal. So why did you do it anyway? Yep. So it always comes back to me, right? I'm trying to... And, and it's, it's just taking that energy away from being able to sort of, you know, work with someone that you really love. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing, I think, you know, when we look at, you know, the sales and marketing engine of our business, <clears throat> which I think is one of the most important parts of your business to work on, right? And, you know, when you talk to, I think it's a, it's a trap that new businesses fall into that we just say yes to whatever dollars come through the door. And we kind of try to do everything and be everything for everybody. And I see it constantly at, uh, you know, through networking events that I still go to. And, you know, a great referral for me this week is anybody or somebody. I go, but it's not though, right? You know, somebody and anybody is not a great referral for you. Right? And the more specific that you are in terms of what you want, as you're saying, the more likely you are to get and attract that thing and repel the thing that you don't want. And it's it's a scary place to be when we're a, when we're a new business where, you know, we've got, obviously we've got cost of living pressures and everything else as well. But it, if you kind of run down this rabbit hole of doing stuff that you don't want to do, not to sort of quote Star Wars here, forever will it dominate your destiny, right? You'll be stuck doing this thing and not actually creating space for the thing that you really want. So it's a, I guess it's an, a feeling like you have no choice reality rather than being at choice reality and then taking, and this is the hard one for 99% of the population, taking full responsibility to create that reality and Mm. trusting 100% in yourself that irrespective of what appears to be going on, it will sort itself out. And, And this is the funny thing. If you look at fear, right? Most people's biggest fears already exist. So if they already exist and they're living them on a day to day basis, they're okay, right? They're handling it. So what's your worst fear of whatever's going to happen? Well, let's, are you actually living that right now? So for a lot of people, if they don't, like the, their biggest fear may be regret by the time they get to the end of their life and go, I never lived the life I wanted to live. Well, are you living the life you want to live now? No. Well, then you're okay. So <laughs> you can get the only person that's control over that is you, right? Yeah. So they're talking, you're okay. You know, you're going to be okay. Now you can get on with it. It does remind me of a few, like quite a few years back now, I was kind of running my media, social media company which ironically started in 99, not too far after sort of MySpace was the thing <laughs> when we first got online, right? And and was running that, but I was working sort of, I had a full-time day job in IT project management. And, it, and towards the end of that, I was just going, this is not what I want to do. I've got my business kind of going really well. We've got, you know, a couple of million subscribers I need to sort of, you know, need to sort of deal with. And, you know, I, I can't really build this business in my lunch break and on, on coffee breaks between project meetings and stuff. And I, I said to my employers at the time, I said, I want, you know, one day a fortnight to kind of work on this. I'll still have my work phone on. I'm in and out of the office anyway, and we're still delivering outcomes. And went back and forth, and ultimately I decided this is not working. You can't make up your mind. You're paying me lots of money to sort of do this anyway, you know, to make decisions. So I'm going to walk away from this entirely. And when you're in sort of corporate and, and government, as many of us know, you, you tend to like, not move on until you've got a another safe net to go to, a safe job to go to. As you finish one job Friday, start the new job Monday, right, and just roll on. And I remember a conversation with a girl in my team at the time, and she she hated her job, right? She would regularly end up in tears at the end of the day from the 
from the pressure of the work environment. Yeah. And she said to me, I mean, because a lot of people say, oh, where are you going? And I think I said, I'm going skiing in Japan for five weeks and then I'm going to come on, come back and decide what I want to do. Like, I was like, oh, I can never do that, right? And, I, and she asked me the same thing. It says, where you where, you know, what company you're going off to and, and, and stuff like that. And I'm going, oh, you know, that was my stuck response. Going skiing, I'll decide, you know, I'm going to hit fresh tracks first thing in the morning. I'll ski until last light. It's going to be awesome. Which it was. And she said, she was, she, I remember her words. She said, I could never do that. And I've gone, but you you hate your job. What are you, what are you doing? You really don't like being here. I actually bumped into her a couple of years later and she'd quit corporate work and she was working with disadvantaged and, and homeless kids. Right. And the, like, you know, finally actually sort of having done something completely different, it clearly wasn't the money. And she goes, oh, she was getting probably paid a shit ton more in corporate than she was. But her energy and her vibrancy when she started talking about what she was what she was doing was just so enlightening and passionate and kind of really you know you know me like you surround people with people who kind of fucking just love what they do they're kind of nice to be around aren't they they just their energy and everything just sucks you in and go oh, you want you're them. better. That's the thing I talk about when passion, you combine your passion with your talent, you provide the most value. So she'd obviously found that sweet spot and you feel it. So people, if you look at it as a deeper level of money is just, or business is just people value money versus the thing they to buy or vice versa, right? So for example, if it's a watch, you might value my watch more than your money. So you give me, and I value your money more than the watch. That's where the, the, the transfer occurs, right? Yeah. But it also happens energetically. If I get, if I want your, what you're giving, I'm willing to pay for that service or whatever it is, because I want to feel that feeling. And ultimately, this is the thing about all of it. It's because that thing gives you that feeling, right? So if you value that feeling more than money, then most people will buy that thing. It's quite amazing. It's just about essentially feelings. We, we all just want to feel certain feelings. Yeah. Tell me, okay, you've done a good amount of passions. I want to, I want to drill into this book story because you've written close to 100 children's books in three or four months, right? But that's come off the back of a values misalignment with some people at your cricket club. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Coaching kids cricket. Tell me about that. So again, super passionate. I used to play cricket for my state in New Zealand. Was gonna, it was going to be my career. And then obviously, they. there's a quick side story. They made a school rule at my school that said I had to choose cricket over volleyball. And for outliers, you don't tell them what they have to do. You give them the choice, right? I wasn't given the choice. So I said, get stuff. And it changed my whole life career direction. And I started playing volleyball a lot more seriously and stopped playing cricket. Anyway, 30 years later or 25 years later or whatever, I came back to cricket because my kids were starting playing and I thought, what a great sport to them. And I can help them and share with that. And so I was coaching my rep cricket team here in Sydney and talk about another thing that outliers don't do well is politics, right? So there's these scumbags in the, in the club who clearly were rattled by people being more competent than them. They were willing to embrace mediocrity and it rattled their cages. And so they undermined me and, 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 and just honestly, you want to see the lies and stuff that they shared about me. But anyway, and I still feel totally angry about it today. That was over a year ago or a year ago to now, but I thought I'm going to turn this into a positive. So one thing that really I was so passionate about with the kids is helping them be the best they can be because what I also know is a lot of parents don't know what I know about personal development, professional development, and everything that I know, and nothing to do with the parents. It's just the journeys that they're on, right? So I thought, well, how can I share that through the cricket, which we were doing? So teaching them all sorts of really cool stuff. And then, again, axed, right? Betrayed, shafted, whatever you want to call it, through, through I, I like to say, fear and insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, but how can I turn this into a positive? So... I wrote down all the values I was teaching them and then I created, so with the outlier series, I go and interview entrepreneurs living outside the comfort zone. But I thought, what about something like for kids that's the outlier league and there are a bunch of superheroes that all resonate with the same message of being an outlier, but they also, each character has their own, like the Marvel characters have their own look and feel as well as their key strengths. Yeah. So each of the characters have their own, obviously, look and feel. They're young kids. They're young, dominant athletes. They live on the Outliers, which is a bunch of islands off the mainland. They The mainland's called Same Old, Same Old. And the people that live on the mainland are called the Conformists. And the out live on the Outliers, which is the, the, the geographic name. And it's a beautiful islands with tropical beaches and palm trees and beautiful mountains and everything. And that's where they live, right? And they're all about 
being the best they can be, having a great time and sharing and supporting each other. And then there's the mentor and he's called the outlier. So he's like that. And he's essentially me in that process where I help the younger kids with just wisdom and, and key short key messages to help them overcome their challenges. Yeah. So every book starts with a challenge. They're being overseen or being berated or bullied by the out, are the conformists and they're really struggling. And the outlier comes along with his message, teaches them some cool stuff around breath work, meditation, focusing on what they want, et cetera, et cetera, the, the key values of the book. And then they overcome it and then they win their race or they win their whatever sport that they're playing. They succeed. They succeed, right? It's the classic, what's the word? Journey. Hero's journey. Yeah. But from a leverage perspective, so that's sort of like the underpinning my passion and values behind it. But I really have been embracing the power of AI to support that process, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that's really important about AI is you got to prompt it exactly how you want it to get what you want back. So that in itself is a journey. But once I got clarity on the characters, the island, the locations, the, and what they stand for, et cetera, and I, and I punched that into, to, to, I use Gemini. When I punch that in, it spits back and I go, no, no, and I'll modify it until I'm happy. Then that gives me some fundamentals I punch into every book. And then I punch in about the characters. What are their challenges? What are the three key solutions I want to give to them? What success will they have, et cetera? Punch that in. And then once you've done a few books, it start, you can upload one of the books and it starts to, I say, follow this book, right? Yeah. So you get a message from this, but it's related now to this person or this new character. And it spits out similar but different story. And it, so I've got a team that helps me with that. Then I get a team. So the team helps me with typesetting, all the cover design, the graphics and, and things like that. Uploading to Amazon, KDP and, and Kindle. And I'm turning them into audibles as well. I have an illustrator at the moment who's got a massive task to illustrate them. But the two things that are really cool. So I wrote, I think it was like, so initially there was 33 books. For 14 year old 10 to 14 year old so they're a bit more aimed at that age group but then i said to gemini can you please turn these into 20 pages one paragraph of four sentences sentences per page for three to ten year olds and i want it to be a rhyme so rhyming books right and that came out of me just reading i've got a five-year-old daughter just reading one of her rhyming books and thought this is awesome because that's the age you know they resonate with that at that age so gemini was amazing it spat out these incredible 20 pages and, and four sentences per paragraph for the page rhymes. So they gave me another 33 books. And then I have other books that I've do for the older age group, right? And so same book, same message delivered totally different way. That gives me 99 books. And then the other books that I've written, are, I've written the outlier life. I've written the outlier business plan and I've written the outlier agreements. And they're for adults that then stem into a program and helping them dissipate their any challenges that they have as well. But that then that's an automated process as well. But that all came out of, yeah, being shafted at cricket. Well, they take opportunity from adversity, right? In order to convert your message. Like I coached rugby for a, for a long kids rugby for a long time. So I know the same again, the same purpose sort of in that to go, let me kind of create an opportunity where we can foster teamwork and triumph over adversity through shared experience and, and all those sorts of things that are really important about is but one of the one things I, I want to sort of get into, a lot of the stuff that you've done from a marketing context has always been kind of leveraging platforms to kind of create reach. Okay, so you've, you've just sort of shared with how using AI to create lots of books to share, you know, a message that's really important to you. And I think it's really important in, in, in society anyway. But talk to me, I want to really go into how you've used YouTube to build, you know, your subscription business with the golf channel and all the various golf channels that you've, you've run in golf university. Let's drill into that a little bit. Why YouTube to start with? And then the question, how have you done that? So first things first, go back to the, when I was going through my process around golf, right? Like, what do I want to do? Well, I want to, video was the, the tool. And I wanted to travel the world, going to amazing courses, amazing places, and then sharing it with other passionate golfing tourists. So at first it was a TV show, right? And YouTube was only just sort of becoming prominent when I started the show in 2011. And what was interesting is I cut up all my footage into snack. I call it snackables. It's like, you know, three to five minute vids. So each part of the show was its own segment. And I had over 750 videos, right? I dumped them all onto YouTube because I had no knowledge of YouTube at the time other than a platform. Dumped them all on one day. The worst thing I could possibly have done because even if I dripped two of those pieces of content a week from that time, I'd still be dripping them today. And why that's important 
now that I have all this YouTube knowledge, is the algorithm loves regularity of content, right? And sees that I'm a legitimate channel and it, and it helps me. So the, this is the most powerful thing about YouTube is it's owned by Google. So it's the second largest search engine in the world, but it's putting my content in front of the right people at the right time based on what they're searching for. So it's doing all my marketing for me, right? And I'll give a really good example. I have one of my videos in particular on Golf Uni went out to my 20,000 database and then I know my stats from there. So 20% open rate, which sounds crazy, but it, that's normal. So go to the numbers on that. That's 4,000, I think it is, opened. Then 20% clicked. Well, 25, 26 is my average, right? Click, so 1,000 then clicked. And I would assume then watched the video, right? So from all of my efforts, 1,000 watched it from my 20,000 database. That video has now had almost 800,000 views. So when I look at my stats on the back end of that video, and this is not just this video, there's many like this, but this is one that's a, like an outlier in them. At least 95% of those came through suggested. Now suggested on YouTube means YouTube suggesting the content to others. Yes, you're watching this, you might also like that. Absolutely. Okay. Amazon obviously do the same, but it's that little section on the side that says you watch this, here is some related content. Yeah. And so what, just to, for the viewer's sake, what is profound about that is the leverage, right? What you, where else can you get, and that was free by the way, once I've created the content, which took me 10 minutes to film and then to edit, which doesn't take long because it was shot on one camera. So clip the front, clip the back right at the end. And then there's a video, upload it with some graphics. What's the return on that? It's 800 times. What's a, if, a, if each time it doubles is a hundred percent, that's 800,000 percent. Yeah. Would that be right? It's significant. Like it's significant. Lots. And, yeah, and the beautiful thing with YouTube, it's not just, I'm not going on YouTube to get views. Views give me some revenue, but what I have in the videos are either my sponsors who get fit viewed. So they get, they're paying me to be in it or I have programs off the back of it. So I not only- That's where the real revenue opportunity is. And, and I think, you know, we need to make this clear for people. Yeah, unless you're like going to be a content creator and that is your job and you're going to go for sponsorship, but it is really, that's the small, that's the small dollars. And I, I think I've seen some of your stats when you look at even that $800,000, 800,000 view video, it's only worth a couple of thousand dollars in revenue, isn't it? Yeah. For, in, in terms of, in terms of ad share right? and, and the way YouTube works is that they'll, you know, they'll put ads in your content. You've probably seen if you've ever watched a YouTube video, right? And they'll give you a little, a small percentage share of the ad effort revenue that they're making for creating content that they can put ads in. That's right, isn't it? Absolutely. So flip it in reverse. If you advertise on and you put, you want to go into YouTube ads and create ads to put on your, your out to your market, yep. it will cost you about three to five cents per click. And the beautiful thing again with YouTube, if you're an advertiser is you get 30 seconds before you have to pay for it. So people can watch the first 30 and it's free. And if they don't click on watch now or whatever your ad is, and it doesn't go over 30 seconds, it was free. So in reverse, as a content creator, I would typically get one to one and a half cents of that three to five cents if anyone does then, sorry, watches that video. So it, it's it's a beautiful- it's not, it's not a lot, it's not really sustainable, is it? No, not unless you're going to see 30 million views and all of your videos have 30 million views. It's not, it's like one-off revenue. It's not It's not your recurring revenue, which is obviously what we want as- Well, as, as, that's-, that's so here's the thing, right? But if you, I'll use the analogy of property development. So think about your channel as a building. So yeah. what you really want to build as a building and each floor is maybe categories related to your content, but each floor has its own apartment and they're your videos. And then you might have, I mean, I've got for Golf Uni, I might have 400 videos. Some may make me nothing. Some may make me hardly anything each month, but others make me quite a lot per month. But without having the whole thing, you don't have a building, if that makes sense. So the, the yeah. building is like the overall development, that's the channel. And each little apartment is your rent that you get each month from each apartment. And some it's not a guaranteed rent and it's not a guaranteed amount of rent. But the higher, and this is where it's important with video marketing, is when you create your content, there's a specific process that you can follow that'll make it a lot more engaging, relevant to your audience. And this is probably the most important part not just about creating anything like so you see a lot of the content creators just randomly creating anything for business owners the most important part is being very clear on your niche which i know we talk about in many other forms but very clear on your niche niche what are their core problems what content are you putting in front of them that they feel was valuable and help them overcome or give them a solution to that problem 
But then by doing that, you build your reputation and rapport and you become their preferred provider, hopefully, e.g. they subscribe, they watch all pieces of content. And then because you've got a call to action in your content, they will come to you as your con- as the consultant or as a service provider. I'll give you another quick analogy. I've got another business. We're a contract food manufacturing business and a juice business, right? We put together 10 videos. It has 60 subscribers on the channel. But every time people see it, it, the reason we did it is to raise the search engine SEO. Videos rank higher than text. So I knew in contract food manufacturing, there's, people aren't thinking marketing, they're thinking production, right? So I knew if I applied my system, we could gazump the whole thing with SEO and become top of the SEO search engine for a few videos. And that's proven to be the case. And then we flipped them into blogs and, and also did some written stuff. But 60 subscribers... Hardly any views, hundreds and thousands, if not millions of dollars comes from that because the orders that come in once they say, we want you to be our manufacturer are worth hundreds of thousands. They're not. Now, real key is, and this is, I guess, is where AI can really help us is actually say, well, what am I only want to hear about? Right? Unless you know, unless you're really experienced in the, in the industry that you're going into. And, you know, I would certainly encourage that to say, this is probably a core part of business. I right? know what Jill is talking about. But, you know, we can use AI to look at bigger data and go, well, what are my key pain points that I should be talking about in my content? And I think the big takeaway for me in what you've just shared there, Andrew, is have a call to action. Send people from your content to another thing, right? So to a call, to an ebook, to an assessment, to a, a, a meeting, to a whatever, right? But move people from your content to something else because the content itself won't make you the money. It's It's... It's like a nice to have, what I would call beer money, right? You know, if, you, if your content's making you any money from an ad share, fantastic. That's a nice bonus. But don't expect it to have your content there be really purposeful about going to the next thing. Right, right. So if you look at standard content creators who get massive views, but they literally don't have a business behind it necessarily. So if you could do massive views and have a business behind it by guessing their email address off the back of your videos as a bare minimum, they're your clients, not YouTube's. So you don't have to keep producing content if you don't want. You can send emails or newsletters or whatever. And so every Tuesday at 8 a.m., I send my golf newsletter to my clients, uh, to my guard database for two reasons. It flames the video on YouTube, which then YouTube sees as action happening. So it starts sharing it even more in that first 24 to 48 hours. Hmm. Right. But it also keeps reputation rapport happening with my clients. So I keep helping them. And then in every video, there's a call to action. Is it my program? Is it coming to a golf school? Well, is it whatever? It just keeps feeding the system. And, and I forget the guy's name, uh, Ryan Bouchard or something. Brendan uh, Bouchard. Brendan Bouchard. He talks about it being called circular virality. So if you've got a system that just keeps circling in on itself, as long as you own that database by getting them off that those content platforms, then you've got a business. So if, if everything shit hits the fan, you know, and this is where someone like Scott Bywater is really good. He understands the value of database, right? And you're the same with what you do with automation. Mm. It's like, you know, we, we harp on about it, but it, you cannot beat having a database. I'd much rather have a database than a heap of views on a, on a video. Yeah. Yeah. So true. It's, it's, it's the difference between, I guess, you know, owned traffic versus just a rented traffic. If you want to listen to the the episode with Scott, it was back on episode, I can't even remember now, there it is, episode 46, and we were talking about copywriting there and creating that sort of next step. And I think that's really, really important to do. All right, we're going to, we're going to, to, to wrap up now because, but I mean, so many value bombs that you've, that you've shared with us already. And I think those things about, you know, using other people's traffic, right, to kind of build your own audience and your own network and give them what they want, right? You, YouTube want more views. So if you can give them content that gets them more views so that they can sell more advertising, you know, it's a nice little symbiotic environment and they don't care if you send it elsewhere afterwards. Let's go with this one. I'm going to throw this one at you. Tell me super quick, you know, those of you watching on YouTube, this, this episode, your background there is a bonfire on a beach with you and a bunch of mates. Where is that? Tell me about that day. Great question. Beautiful. It's the birthplace of Fiji. It's the sacred islands. We were, it was 4 a.m. And if you, I don't know if you can see it behind me, there's a mast. So the mast is, I'm interviewing for Outlier, the series, Joe Don. He's one of the only livable dive charter yachts in Fiji. So we were out there interviewing him for Outlier. We got to this island where we were going to do the app. And you can see the app on outlier.tv forward slash watch. We're sitting on his boat. 
So we take the little tender, the little rubber dinghy, and we put it on the sand, and, and that's where we do our interview, just after the light, you know, the sun came up. But this was just before we found this wood. I thought, what an amazing thing if we could create this bonfire. I, I made it, it look like we are sitting there listening to the bonfire as if it's the wise old messenger sharing its wisdom, which is what Outlier is about. And so I framed up this picture, got it shot by the cameraman, and then we, after that, light comes up and we we film the rest of the episode. But so that's what it is, birthplace of Fiji, sacred island. Love it. How do you balance work and family life? I've got a great wife who does a lot of the family stuff, got three beautiful kids. But, mate, the beautiful thing is you'd know of being an entrepreneur, we set our own time. So, like, for example, this morning I'm up early getting all my admin done. I've got a massive filming trip coming up this at the end of this week. Next week, I'm off to King Island for 10 days, and I've got a month trip to, to, to New Zealand for Golf Getaway. Yep. So it's all just planning. And then I have, you know, outsourced team. So a lot of outsourced team working on stuff while, while I'm working on other stuff. I'm the, I'm the creator or the gardener, and they do the gardening. I, I'm sort of the architect, and they're the builders. What's one tool you always have in your toolbox, no matter what project you're working on? Video and my... Similar to you, database software. Yeah. Either probably the two biggest. Oh, a little extension question on that. You shoot on a GoPro or just on your phone? Good question. Drones and phones, probably a yep. good little rhyme there, but I have Canon DSLRs, but I find them a pain in the ass. They're very expensive. They cost more than a car just for a lens. Yeah. But they are painful because you've got to change the lens and for the different distances you're filming. They're beautiful footage, but not much better than the phone. So I'm a, I'm a real advocate of the phone. Love it. If you had 10 times the budget you have now for marketing, what would you spend it on? 10 times the budget. That's a really good question because I'm always, when I look at myself, I'm always preferring to go and create. So I'll pay to create and produce content knowing it's going to be an asset. That's the other cool thing, guys, I never mentioned. Content's an asset. See it like property where it is actually, if it's working for you, it's an asset. So I prefer to do that because I get to go to these amazing places and create the content and and then the ads and everything off the back end is always, it's its almost like the secondary thought. Yeah. If you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice from your journey so far, what would it be? Uh, stay true to yourself. Keep like, don't, wait. If, if someone has an issue with you, it's not your problem. If you have an issue with it, it's your problem. You need to tune in. And, and, and so obviously that's all the things I do. But back then, you know, you kind of see the outside world as, as the outside world. But it's, it's not. It's actually a mirror of you. So how can you own it? How can you use it to, to learn from it quick, quick as you can and then move forward through it? Yep. All right. Tough one for you because I know you've played on so many. Favorite golf course you've ever played on? Good question. So I love Natandola Bay in Fiji. It's just because it's. I'm all about the water, the ocean, and the beautiful grass and, and everything like tropical island, right? I love tropical island. So anything that's relevant. So Cowrie Cliffs in New Zealand, Cape Kid, Kidnappers in New Zealand. Nat and Dollar in Fiji, they're, they're three big standouts for me. Hamilton Island in Australia, it's right, you know, it's an island that's in a beautiful location. All the outliers. If you could recommend one business book that you think every business owner should read at some point in their journey, what would it be? Uh, I forget the name of it, but it was written by Ricardo Semler, and it's a fantastic story. I think he's Brazilian. He was inherited his business from his dad, I think. It wasn't running very well, and he turned everything everyone in the organization into their own little micro teams that they all had their own responsibility. They were rewarded for results and stuff. I found that fascinating at the time that I'd read it. And the only reason I'm saying that right now is just intuitively, that's the first one that comes up. Always Rich Dad Poor Dad's a winner for me. It's all about leverage and rather than carrying buckets, having a pipeline and the cash flow quadrant will help people, you know, to, to step from entrepreneur, uh, from employee through to self-employed through to business owner. Those are three big, great books. Yeah. Uh, the book you're thinking of is probably called Maverick. Yeah, Maverick. That's the one. Beautiful. Here's the one. Here's the one. He, he took it over from his, as they took over the family business and basically radically changed the management structure, didn't he? Yeah, it was magic. Yeah. The great, great uh, TED, TED Talk presentation on that one as well. Yeah. Last thing, where can we find you online? Uh, outlier.tv if you want to, I guess, is, so well, something we didn't talk about is how I often turn content into documentaries and in, and they're actually indirect ways of people buying my program but helping the people share their stories even better so i'm not sure if you heard what i said there but it, people who heard it will have heard it that's yeah. my programs that we're running but they're framed as a doco now when they're framed as a doco people are egoically attached and want to buy them more if it was just a program they're like oh it just sounds like another program so anyway so outlier.tv if you want to 
turn your passion into your pension. Golfgetaway.tv if you want to watch amazing golf content and go on tours, golf schools and play tournaments. And Golf University if you want to, uh, .tv if you want to have golf lessons. There we go. Mate, clearly I need to get on to golfuniversity.tv. So we'll put the links to those in the show notes, guys. Thanks so much for joining us today, Andrew. Really appreciate you sharing your passions, mate, and, and some of your journey in business. Looking forward to seeing the next adventure you're on and sharing that with you and our audience as well. Guys, if you've enjoyed today's show, like, subscribe, follow, and share it with someone who could get a good dose of passion into their business. And uh, we'll catch you on another episode real soon. 